Carolyn Lausch.
Welcome everyone to another ESU Happy Hour. Today's Happy Hour program is Architecture in London from 1066 to 1800. Our guest speaker is Dr. James Glass. My name is Jeff Schnabel and I'm on the Happy Hour Committee as well as the programming chair of the ESU Kansas City branch. I would like to give a big thank you to the Indianapolis branch, the sponsor of today's happy hour. Ideas for our happy hour programs come from our members and viewers just like you. At the end of this program, you will receive a survey in your email where you can share your feedback on today's happy hour. As always, we welcome your ideas for future happy hour topics. As you know, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the program. You may send your questions or comments using the dedicated Q&A and chat buttons at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to send questions at any point during the presentation. However, do note that questions will be answered in the order that they are received. And today I'm thrilled that we have over 300 registered for today's program. That's close to a record, I think. I would also like to give a shout out to the branches with the most registered members today. They are the, the New York branch, Greenwich branch, and the Indianapolis branch. So now I would like to introduce to you Carolyn Lausch. She is the uh, board member and secretary with the Indianapolis branch. Carolyn and her husband, Jean, became ESU members after she was selected to receive a six week T-Lab scholarship in 1992 to study in the UK. They have been ESU members for 31 years and have known Dr. Glass for 45 years. So now, here's Carolyn, who will tell you a little bit about the Indianapolis branch and introduce Dr. Glass. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you very much. It's a privilege for me to be here. The Indianapolis branch in 2024 will be celebrating its 75th anniversary with the English Speaking Union. We have 44 members. We are active with the T-Lab, the Shakespeare competition, and we also have a scholarship with Indiana University so that a British student can get some financial help with his or her studies. I would like to recognize one of our members who last November in Charleston, North South Carolina, received the Excellence in Leadership Award. That's Catherine Lurch. She's been our president for several years and she is the one who designs flyers for our speakers. She's instituted a book discussion group that meets extra during the year. And she and her husband, Keith, who is treasurer of our branch, hold a meet and greet to entice new members to join our local branch. So again, congratulations to Catherine Lurch for her Excellence in Leadership Award. Now I'd like to raise my tea, my Earl Grey tea, which is, Jim is very fond of, and introduce our speaker for today. James A. Glass is currently principal of the firm Historic Preservation and Heritage Consulting. Earlier in his career, Jim served as director of the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, and for 13 years served as director of the graduate program in Historic Preservation at Ball State University. Jim holds a PhD in Architectural History and Historic Preservation from Cornell University. Jim is an expert on and has written articles about the history of the American Historic Preservation Movement. Since 2013, Jim has presented 
illustrated public lectures on the architecture of other countries based on his travels and research. Spanish architecture, architectures in Greece and Turkey, Roman and Renaissance architecture, Chinese and Mexican architecture, and in 2019, architecture in London. And I would like to share that in 2019, a fellow ESU member, Tom Grice, who is with us now here in our home, my husband, Jean and I traveled to London with Jim. And one afternoon we went to Mayfair and spent several hours at Dartmouth House. Once we told the people there that Jim had these excellent credentials concerning architecture and preservation, they invited us to roam throughout the home and enjoy its architecture. And then we had tea out in the patio. So that was just a real treat for us. Dartmouth House, as you know, is the home of the national, international English speaking union. Last spring, Jim traveled to France to augment his knowledge of French architecture. And again, Tom, Jean, and I were pleased to accompany him. And we look forward to a future presentation. Jim is currently preparing a fully illustrated book on architecture in Indianapolis, 1820 to 1920. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. James Glass to the ESU Happy Hour audience to present on Architecture in London, 1066 to 1800. Thank you, Carolyn, for that very nice introduction. And it is a pleasure to be with the English Speaking Union for Happy Hour today and to talk to you today about architecture in London. 1066 to 1800. We're going to begin with an overview slide of the map of London, Greater London. I think everyone is aware that uh, London began as a Roman settlement, Londinium, on the Thames, and somewhat upstream uh, developed the uh, community of the city of Westminster, which was the seat of royal government. This irregular jagged edge uh, here shows the extent of development of London through 1800. We're going to begin with Norman Romanesque. This is architecture brought to uh, England by William the Conqueror in 1066. Uh, there had been Romanesque architecture in England before William, but he brought his own brand of Romanesque from his home duchy of Normandy in France. By a great miracle, one of the major monuments built by William still exists. This is the White Tower in the Tower of London. Uh, we can see it's a defensive structure, uh, but also was the home for the royal family and the royal court. Uh, it is constructed of mason uh, rubble stone with periodic uh, buttresses, which have dressed limestone, as do the crenellations at the top, the battlements. And then there are four different types and sizes of uh, towers. Now, archi Romanesque architecture derives from architecture of the ancient Romans. And one of their chief emblems was the round-headed arch, which we see on the exterior. We go inside the principal room in the interior on the third and fourth floor is St. John's Chapel, uh, where the royal family and the court worshiped. We're standing in the center called the nave, on either side of which are arcades, and outside the arcades are aisles, which become an ambulatory as they round the chancel area where the altar is, and above, covering the whole, is a barrel vaulted masonry vault ceiling. Along the side, we can see a round round arched arcade with columns. Uh, even though uh, Romanesque comes from Roman, Roman architecture, uh, these capitals and these columns are creative. They have leaves uh, by the sculptors, uh, not, not, really, not quite what the Romans would have used. Above the arcade is a uh, gallery with round-headed arches. All parts are emblems of Romanesque architecture. Now we're going to leap ahead uh, from 1100 to 1245 to Gothic, develop, we might call developed Gothic. Why are we doing this? Well, there's virtually nothing left, left of London architecture between 1100 and 1245. But if we go to 1245, we come to one of the landmarks of medieval architecture in London, 
Westminster Abbey, begun by King Henry III in 1245, completed about 1400. Um, if we look at a plan, we can see what an immense church this is. Um, the, uh, the longest arm is called the nave, and the nave proper is its center, bounded by aisles. Uh, and at the intersection of the transepts, the north and south transept, is what is, is, is called the crossing. Beyond that, to the east of the crossing, is the presbytery, where the high altar is. The aisles continue through past the crossing and around the ambulatory. That's called a, uh, an ambulatory, as it or go rounds the presbytery. And then it communicates with radiating chapels. Now, we're now looking east from the 19th century choir towards the crossing and the transepts, towards the presbytery. We know the name of the uh, master mason who designed uh, and uh, supervised the construction of the east end of the Westminster Abbey. His name was Henry de Rennes. And we should also note that there was profound influence of uh, French architecture on the design of Westminster Abbey, particularly around Paris and some of the great uh, 13th century French cathedrals such as Rams. If we turn west and look down the nave, which was completed a little later than the east end, we see a lofty space. The lofty height is an influence from French, French architecture also, 101 feet tall, 71 feet wide. English elements uh, are this uh, arcade with these large uh, pointed arch uh, arches forming the, the upper parts of the arcade. And uh, the arcade is supported by piers covered with black Purbeck marble from England. Another French element is the six partite rib vaults. These exert a tremendous amount of thrust, which on the outside are absorbed by flying buttresses, another influence in France, uh, which are sustained further by step buttresses, all in limestone. If we look at the south side of the nave, uh, we see another influence in France, namely uh, windows with uh, double lancet windows are called, and above which are tracery called catrafoils. Uh, for the tribune of the triforium level, we have three round circles constituting the tracery here. And then at the clear story window level, we have windows which replicate the patterns of the aisle windows. Now, there was a hiatus in construction of Westminster Abbey from about uh, 1400 to 1503. But in the latter date, King Henry, Henry VII began construction of a chapel in the east end of Westminster Abbey, which ultimately was to house the tombs of him and his, his queen, Elizabeth of York. We know the names of the master masons of uh, the Henry VII Chapel, the William Virtue and Henry Redmond, and they created one of the great masterpieces of English architecture. Every inch of the walls, the piers, and the vaults are covered and crusted with elaborate sculpture. And we particularly want to look up at the ceiling, at the fan pendant vaults, which make up uh, the vaults of the uh, chapel. You can see the fans centered uh, at regular intervals intersecting each other. They are uh, spring from transverse arches, which carry the weight of the ceiling. And also uh, from the transverse alt hang uh, elaborate pieces of sculpture called pendants, pendant fan vaults. The other thing to note is the openwork sculpture, which covers every iota of the vaults, making this truly an aesthetic masterpiece. Now, parallel to the development of pendant fan vaults was uh, the development and timber of hammer beam truss roofs in England and in London from about 1350 to 1575. Another miracle is that one of the masterpieces of hammer, team, hammer beam truss roofs uh, has survived in London, and this is in Westminster Hall across the street from Westminster Abbey. Uh, why it was uh, built between 1393 and 1402. Uh, then we know the name of the master carpenter, Hugh Herland. Why a hammer beam truss roof for wide spanned halls? Well, they enabled the span to be crossed without columns, which would be visually obtrusive. What is a hammer beam truss roof? Well, the hammer beams come out horizontally from either side. They are supported by braces, they in turn support hammer post, which sustain arch braces, uh, which uh, support a tie beam and finally a king post at the very top. Truly a wonder of structural engineering as well as something, a, a, a building which has sculptural qualities. Now we've been talking about royal buildings and uh, churches. 
Uh, we're going to turn our attention to vernacular buildings in London uh, that uh, the common people would have lived in, uh, con chief, constructed chiefly of timber and stucco. These began to appear about 1350 and continued up to 16, 1650. One of the very few of these buildings that live, survives in London is the so-called uh, Queen's House uh, in the Tower of London, uh, built by Henry VIII about 1530. Uh, we can see that there's a formula sort of developed for these vernacular houses. The upper stories and the these uh, parallel gables are constructed, the walls are constructed of stucco and timber. The timber is actually the structural elements and the infill is stucco. And then another element of the formula is to have a dark colored brick first story. We're going to turn our attention now to Tudor palaces uh, built by the first uh, two monarchs of the Tudor dynasty, namely Henry VII and Henry VIII. They built four to five of these palaces. Of these, only one exists, uh, survives in any extent. That is the Hampton Court Palace, uh, started by Cardinal Wolsey about 1515 and continued by Henry VIII uh, in the 1520s. We're looking at the entry of a wing of the Hampton Court Palace, dominated by this enlarged gatehouse. The gatehouse proper is its center with these attenuated eight-sided turrets flanking a broad entryway leading into the gatehouse uh, itself, and above which is a projecting oriel window. Now, the core gatehouse is extended by these walls and terminates in these much larger eight-sided turrets with crenellations. One of the things to note is that this palace is built of brick. Up until about 1500, the royal buildings and churches were chiefly constructed of stone. After about 1500, brick increasingly came to the fore. Why was that? It could be fired in kilns near the site. It could be economically uh, and quickly uh, constructed on tight time frames. And it lent itself to different colors. As you can see, the, the major gatehouse is built of this orange red brick color. And outside, the wings are a more subdued color. If we look at a plan of uh, Hampton Court, we can see its defensive character. The, the first gatehouse leads into what is called the base court. Another narrow gatehouse leads into clock court. And if we go to the clock court, we see one of the major structures built by Henry VIII, namely the Great Hall. It exhibits on its side elevation uh, late Gothic or perpendicular Gothic features, such as these rectangular windows with broad arches, flanked by step buttresses with dressed limestone, which culminate in pinnacles. Inside is another major hammer beam truss roof in English architecture, uh, with again the hammer beam supporting hammer post, brace, tie beam, and king post. In this case, the carpenters have added pendants in wood following the stone model. But for an even more uh, splendid example of pendant, uh, pendants, carved pendants in wood, we can go a few steps uh, from the Great Hall to the Royal Chapel, Chapel Royal, also built by Henry VIII, and look up at marvelous wooden pendant vaults. If we look at these, the these has upraised wooden ridges, which form irregular geometric steps. Periodically, uh, these uh, ridges become ribs, and from them are suspend suspended these elaborate works of wood sculpture, pendants. Jeffrey Webb, one of the great architectural historians in medieval architecture, said of this uh, pendant vault that it was one of the most remarkable pieces of joinery ever achieved, and we'd have to agree. Well, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, a great queen, but the royal government built very little uh, during that period. Instead, Elizabeth's courtiers built what were called prodigy house, great country houses uh, around the country. There are no, no, none of these really left in London, uh, but they had progeny and continued as a, a house form in the reign of Elizabeth's successor, James I. Uh, and there is one of these uh, in particular left in London, uh, an example of Jacobean architecture. And this is uh, the Charlton House in Greenwich, be, be built in 1607. Uh, we can see in the facade here elements from English Tudor Palace uh, architecture, namely the an E-shaped plan with a with a frontispiece, these wings that come out, and then other wings that project out further at the end symmetrically. Another element of English Tudor Palace architecture are oriel windows that project out from the wings. But what is quite different than English Tudor Palace architecture is the treatment of the frontispiece. We take a closer look at this. Uh, we can see evidence of the work of uh, uh, one German uh, pattern bookmaker named Dieterlin. 
Uh, and Dieterlin and his uh, colleagues in Flanders and Germany delighted in their pattern books in creating grotesque interpretations of classical architecture, which was just beginning to creep into England. Uh, we can see that Dieterlin's, and Dieterlin's work is represented by this front of speed. As we look at the first story, we can see that he's followed classical precepts pretty closely in the design of these Corinthian columns. But let's take a look at the second story. We can see that instead of a classical uh, shaft and a column, we have these grotesque, unnatural kinds of interpretations that Dieterlin has used. And at the center of these individual classical entablatures, without any uh, shafts to support them, classical column shafts to support them, they float uneasily without any, any visible means of support, as is the case in the third story. Now, there was a revolution coming in uh, English architecture. We might call this the Italian Renaissance Revolution. And it was personified in the person of Inigo Jones. Here he is. He came from humble means. Uh, he was had some training as a carpenter. But as a young man, he came to the, to the attention of uh, powerful uh, patrons. Uh, and uh, uh, through a connection with the Queen of, King of Denmark, was able to travel to Italy in the 1590s and under another noble sponsor, back to Italy in the 16-teens. Um, Jones um, uh, was chiefly interested in Roman architecture of the ancient Romans, but also had some interest in Italian Renaissance. He particularly uh, conceived a passion for the work of the great 16th century Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio. And so happened that Palladio had published a widely circulated volume, Four Books of Architecture, uh, and Jones achieved, uh, obtained his own copy of this. And as, on his second trip, he traveled to the Veneto area of Italy, where he saw some of Palladio's buildings, and he annotated in his own copy of the four books the differences he saw between the buildings of Palladio design as Palladio built them uh, versus how he had portrayed them in his book. So uh, Jones was quite devoted to Palladio. On his return to England, he came to the attention of the royal court of James I, uh, and uh, he began his connection with that court as a designer of masks. These were elaborate uh, plays put on for the royal court, and Jones designed costumes and the, and the sets. From there, he graduated to architecture, and in the mid-16-teens mid was appointed surveyor of the king's work. This was the official that was in charge of all the building of the royal government, one of the first major buildings that Jones was commissioned was to design and build a royal banqueting house for James I as part of the Palace of Whitehall near Westminster. We're looking at the principal facade and see it owes a great debt uh, to Italian Renaissance architecture as interpreted by Jones. The two horizontal zones uh, separated by an entablature. At the center for visual interest, Jones has uh, placed uh, uh, engaged columns are called Ionic and Corinthian and Ionic in the lower level, Corinthian in the upper level. And then these are echoed by flat two-dimensional pilasters, uh, Ionic and Corinthian. And then in the free zone are what are called swags. On the first story, Jones has borrowed from early 16th century Italian Renaissance houses and palaces, the idea of alternating segmental and triangular pediments above these windows. And then I want you to particularly note that as a field behind these major features, are rustication that Jones has used. Rustication are stone blocks with beveled edges and deeply incised joints. And Jones uh, was to use this repeatedly. If we go inside to the banqueting hall proper, we see that is a double cube. Uh, cubes were much prized in Italian Renaissance for their proportional qualities. And Jones has created this space out of two cubes. We wanna look up too at the ceiling for one of Jones' favorite devices. That is up, deeply upraised, wooden beams encrusted with plaster in this case that form geometric cells. Keep this in mind because we're going to be seeing this repeatedly in Jones' works and others. If we look at the side elevation of the banqueting hall, we can see some echoes of the outside, namely uh, ionic columns, engaged ionic columns on this first level. On the second level, uh, Corinthian pilasters with swags, much like the outside in the freeze zone. And at center are, is a balcony supported by elaborate brackets. Now, the second major building that uh, Jones designed and completed for the, the royal court was the Queen's House at Greenwich. Um, he began work on this in 1616. This was built, the Queen's House was built, and was to be built initially for the Queen Anne of Denmark. But uh, shortly after he started design, the Queen died, and this project was shelved until the early 1630s. When he went back and finished the design, you can see that by the 1630s, 
Jones was favoring a more subdued interpretation of Italian Renaissance architecture. But the garden front is very Italian nonetheless. A look at the center with the, what's called the loggia, this recessed porch inside, recessed within the mass of the building, uh, bounded by onyx columns. Also notice our, the rustication we've seen already, this time used for the first story, and this was a frequent element in Italian Renaissance architecture. Also from the Renaissance is this balustrade at the very top. Now, if we look at a plan uh, of the Queen's house and the, and the site that it occupied, we can see a challenge that faced Jones. It so happened there was a public road existing already that went through the middle of the site. What to do? Well, Jones solved this by designing two pavilions on either side of the public road and then building a bridge across the road. Uh, it intersects with one of the chief spaces inside this uh, hall, which is a single cube, uh, going this proportional device that Jones liked to use. Also notice, look up at the ceiling, more of the upraised, deeply upraised wooden beams forming geometric patterns. In this case, Joan has a conceit. His conceit is that the, the, the patterns formed, the, the ge geometric patterns formed in the roof are echoed loosely by the black and white, these black and white patterns on the marble floor. And then at the center uh, is a, a balustrade uh, carried more, by more of these carved brackets. A final building designed by Jones to note is the Queen's Chapel at St. James Palace, built in the 1620s. The story is as follows. Uh, James had a son, Charles, who was engaged to a Catholic, a Spanish princess who was Catholic. So the royal court in instructed Jones to design a chapel, uh, a Catholic chapel for the princess in London. Um, but in the meantime, that engagement fell apart and Charles was engaged to another Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria of France. So Jones completed the design. Here's the facade. The upper portion is a pediment with supported by consoles. This is adapted from the pediment on uh, one of the great works of Roman architecture, the Pantheon in Rome. At the corners are these uh, alternating stone blocks called coins from Italian Renaissance architecture, as is from the Renaissance, this round-headed window. If we go inside, we see the, the interior is covered by a barrel vault, an arched barrel vaulted ceiling and wood uh, made up of what are called coffers from Roman imperial architecture. At the end, perhaps for the first time in English architecture, is a Palladian or Venetian window, consisting of a round-headed window at center, bounded by pilasters, and outside of which are rectangular windows. Now, there was a hiatus in construction of the government from about 1642 to 1660 during the English Civil War and the Commonwealth. But in 1660, Charles II was restored to the throne, and we might call the next 40 to 50 years of London architecture the Age of Wren. That is, Sir Christopher Wren, a genius, who early in his life became known for his mastery of mathematics uh, and also was appointed professor of astronomy at Oxford University. But he had no training as an architect, but he had quite a passion and interest in architecture. And in the 1660s, he made a trip to Paris where he collected all manner of, 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 of uh, books, plates, and drawings illustrating French architecture and Italian Renaissance architecture, which he was to use to his advantage. Wren's opportunities architect came about largely because of the Great Fire of London of 1666. We see this engraving shows uh, London before the Great Fire. At the center is a monumental Gothic style, old St. Paul's Cathedral, surrounded by red roofed houses and it punctuated occasionally by these rectangular towers representing medieval churches of London. The next slide shows a survey depicting in the white area, the area destroyed, completely destroyed by the Great Fire of London. You see it's a very large area and show the challenge faced by the royal government and rebuilding. Well, Wren came to the attention of Charles II of the royal court and in due course uh, was appointed uh, one of the three commissioners in charge of rebuilding London. And beyond that, he was appointed uh, surveyor general of the, of the Royal Works, the position that Jones had held before him, and then was in, hence in charge of all the building of the royal government. His first major challenge was uh, re designing a new St. Paul's Cathedral and overseeing its construction. Um, it so happened uh, that uh, Wren was quite familiar with the, the design evolution of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome during the 16th century. He was aware of the initial design proposed by an architect named Bramante. Uh, which emphasized a large hemispheric dome with a drum dominating a, uh, a Greek cross uh, body of the church. 
uh, uh, Greek cross denoted uh, four equal arms, uh, the nave, the transepts, and the choir. So uh, uh, Wren uh, adapted this uh, for a so-called Greek cross design of his own from 1672. And you see the drawing here, which in fact does have this monumental dome, much like Bramante's, uh, and then a Greek cross plan. Well, this was rejected by the dean of the St. Paul's Cathedral in the chapter. They did not want a Greek cross plan. They instead wanted a Latin cross plan following the medieval model. So you might say that Wren went back to the drawing board and came up with this design shown by the great model. The Much of the design uh, is unchanged in the Greek cross plan. You still have three equal arms dominated by a very similar dome. But the nave has been extended and now is faced uh, by a, uh, 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 a portico adapted from Roman imperial temples and a shallow dome. Well, this was also rejected. But finally, in 1675, Wren was able to get the consent of Charles II for a, a modified design, uh, which he modified further and achieved at this plan, which we see here. We can see that um, the, the nave and the choir are longer than the transepts. Uh, so the nave probably a little longer, so satisfying the dean. Uh, this hole is dominated by an immense rotunda and dome. Now, if we look at the finished cathedral, we can see how much this monumental large dome dominates the whole structure. We take a closer look at the dome and drum. You can see that the uh, hemispheric dome and the lantern are, are very much like what Michelangelo designed ultimately for St. Peter's Basilica. But the drum is quite different. Here, Wren has created cavities at regular intervals fronted by Corinthian columns. And then occasionally there are masonry infills between columns with niches. And this creates a sense of rhythm. Now, Wren faced a great challenge in the design of the dome. Should he design just an, a, a, an interior dome, uh, the, face, uh, the face of which could be seen easily by worshipers in the rotunda? Or should he build a high profile upper dome that could be seen at advantage from a distance, but the surface of which could not be seen very clearly by worshipers in the rotunda? What to do? Well, Wren's solution was to design three domes. Yes, there's an inner dome with an oculus, but it supports a, third, a second dome, a, a conical shaped masonry dome, which supported a lantern at the very top and through the lantern came natural light down through the oculus. And then the outside of the conical dome, Wren designed a high profile wooden uh, dome, uh, which could be seen at a distance, a really ingenious solution. The facade, uh, the Western facade, uh, the, a highlight of it at center and the upper level is a temple front adapted from Roman imperial architecture. And then at the lower level are these immense uh, pair, uh, paired uh, Corinthian columns. In the upper level are two twin towers uh, designed and built very late in the construction of St. Paul's with these bell-shaped domes uh, and uh, columns on the diagonals uh, recalling Italian Baroque architecture. Now, if we go into the, <laughs> the nave, our eye has moved down the nave to this immense rotunda and drum, and finally to the choir. Well, in addition to overseeing the design and construction of St. Paul's, uh, Wren was charged with building new churches for the city of London. There had been 87 churches before the Great Fire. Uh, Wren and his staff of surveyors uh, designed uh, 51 new ones. We see these red dots denote their location in the city of London. Let's take a look at a couple of these. St. Bride's Fleet Street, built in the 1670s. You see it consists uh, of a tower and a spire. I want to particularly note that Wren has designed this as a basilican plan, namely a nave at the center with aisles on either side. Take a closer look at the tower and spire and see that the lower stages of the tower and the belfry are very much square representations, very similar to the medieval towers they replaced. But above, very different, are these eight-sided uh, uh, open work uh, pavilions uh, with round arches. They've, they diminish in size and are topped by an obelisk. Now, very different uh, than uh, St. Bride's Fleet Street is a church built also early, St. Stephen Walbrook. And some say this is one of Wren's finest city churches. But I must say the entryway in the West is unprepossessing. It's uh, sort of the major feature is this medieval looking tower topped with a Baroque style uh, cupola. Uh, what really uh, stirs our imagination is walking into the church and you see this immense floating dome supported by spherical triangles called pendentives, which in turn are supported by these lofty Corinthian columns. 
And if we look up into the dome, we see one of the supreme examples of the plaster's art. Uh, look at these panels with these vegetative uh, sculptures and plasters. Uh, and then in parallel circles abounding them are coffers from Roman imperial architecture. Now, besides buildings uh, for the royal government, religious buildings, uh, Wren was in charge of building secular buildings for the royal government, uh, such as the Royal Hospital uh, for Army Pensioners at Chelsea, built in the 1680s. Um, we're looking at a, at a U shaped plan, uh, central wing and side wings, which was to be very influential in later English architecture. And the chief feature of the central wing is this Doric portico or temple front, above which, as sort of a, a vertical uh, element, uh, accent is a Baroque style cupola. Now, we look at the side elevation, a uh, side wing, we see that it, some of these elements echoed chiefly in this frontispiece of stone, in this case with flat two dimensional Doric columns. On either side are expanses of brick. The wings on the side are brick. Wren used brick extensively in his designs. In this case, he's using dark brown brick with red brick as surrounds around these simply detailed windows. And this was to be influential later. Also, Wren designed two of the major pavilions of the Naval, Royal Naval Hospital at Greenwich. Uh, we can see these are the two major pavilions. They're uh, symmetrically disposed. Above them is a Renaissance style dome on either side. Uh, and it is screened in part by a paired uh, Corinthian columns around the belfry. And then flanking a long uh, axis uh, leading up to Inigo Jones' earlier Queen's house are these columnar screens on either side. And finally, in the work of Wren, we need to acknowledge his extension of the palace at Hampton Court for William and Mary. William and Mary came to the throne in 1689, and they desired some new wings for their residence at Hampton Court. This is the garden elevation that Wren designed. We can see the debt to Chelsea in the organization of this with this frontispiece of stone with these colossal Corinthian columns uh, of Bedford, white Bedford stone. And then for a contrast from Bath, uh, we have the yellow stone uh, surrounding these windows, uh, and then oculuses in the freeze zone. Our next architect, Nicholas Hawksmore, was a protege of Wren. He, he lived in Wren's house for a time at age 18. Uh, he was uh, hired by Wren for the, 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 the clerk's office, the Royal Works. He gained in his stature and his, his design ability and soon was designing entire structures under Wren and ultimately became an architect on his own. We might say that the architecture created by Hawksmore, we might term creative classicism. Here he is, styled as a Roman in Roman dress, a bust of Hawksmoor. Coming from humble means, he did not make it uh, to uh, the continent, to Paris or to Italy to study Roman and Italian Renaissance architecture. Instead, he amassed an immense library of drawings, books, and plates illustrating Roman uh, imperial architecture and Italian Renaissance architecture. And he was to use this archive uh, or this massive library of his to great advantage. Now, it so happened in 1711 that Parliament passed a law authorizing the construction of 50 new Anglican churches, chiefly in working class suburbs of London. However, only 12 of these were built. And out of the 12, half of them, six, were designed and built by Hawksmoor. So Hawksmoor came out pretty well in this competition. One of the, the most interesting of his churches in the city of London was, is St. Mary's Walnut, begun in 1716, a very unorthodox design. You can see this beginning with the belfry. It's a flat, two-dimensional masonry structure uh, bounded uh, by uh, Corinthian uh, columns, above which, instead of a, a spire, are these two diminutive towers. And then very unorthodox is the treatment of the first and second story of the facade, this deeply rusticated uh, treatment with these deeply incised joints uh, even continues on the shafts, the columns on your side. Where did this come from? Well, you can find such treatment in several buildings by Palladio uh, and also in the work of an Italian Renaissance architect, uh, Giulio Romano. Now, if we look at an axonometric drawing of this church, we can see another major difference between Hawksmoor's approach here and how Wren approached many of his city churches. Wren and many of his city churches designed rectangular bodies of the church. Instead, Hawksmoor has created a square within a square for his church. And also, again, look at the, how two-dimensional this belfry is. If we go inside the inner square, we can see it's bounded by these colossal Corinthian columns. If we look up into the clear story, we can see natural light flooding in through these immense lunette windows. 
And another church we should take a look at for Hawksmoor, another very uh, creative and unorthodox uh, uh, interpretation of uh, Roman architecture, uh, is Christchurch Spitalfields in the working class uh, suburb of Spitalfields. And again, let's look at the belfry. We've got these two flat two-dimensional two -dimensional screens, we might call them, uh, that are embellished by Italian Renaissance uh, niches, above which we make a transition to a medieval brooch spire. So we have two very unlike elements brought together there. Another unusual element is this immense portico made up of Doric columns with a break in the center and round arches over. Where did this come from? Well, if you go to the Roman Emperor Hadrian's villa at Tivoli, you'll find a structure called the Canopus. It's very similar. Then finally, in this case, instead of a square treatment of the church body, uh, Hawksmoor has followed Wren's lead with a, Renaz with a rectangular uh, nave. This brings us to a very different type, uh, an another architect, uh, James Gibbs, uh, one of the masters of the early 18th century in London and English architecture. Uh, and here he is. Uh, he came from a well-to-do family. He had a very different training pattern than Hawksmoor. He was fortunate to go to Italy and study Roman architecture and Ro Italian Renaissance architecture firsthand. He even worked in the office of a late master, Carlo Fantana. Um, he was uh, close, to, uh, he was a Catholic and close to the high church party, but he was also able to gain commissions on occasion from the Whigs, which were the opposing party, and a group of Whigs were dominant in the parish of St. Martin in the Fields, and hired uh, Gibbs to design a new church. Uh, this became one of the major churches of the 1720s in London. It exists at the edge of what is now ha uh, Trafalgar Square. Now, Gibbs owed several major elements of this church to Wren City churches, namely the idea of a rectangular nave or body of the church, and also the idea of a tower and a spire. What's very different is Gibbs' uh, placement of a monumental portico drafted from uh, temples in Roman imperial architecture for the West End, and also his placement of the tower and spire. While Wren and Hawksmoor would have placed their towers and spires at the side of the church or at the end, uh, Gibbs places it on top of the, a ridge gable roof, the ridge of a gable roof, which many, many critics said was an unnatural combination, but nonetheless, this became very influential, particularly in English colonies. Now we go take a closer look at the tower and spire. We can see the more conventional approach to the belfry, but above it, going back perhaps to Wren St. Bride's Fleet Street, is this eight-sided structure uh, with round arches uh, with periodic uh, Corinthian columns with individual entablatures, and finally a perforated spire. If we go inside the church, we see more debts to Wren City churches, and some of Wren City churches, he used a basilican plan, namely a nave at the center of the aisles on either side. Um, he also would use columnar structures and from them hang balconies in some instances. We see that Gibbs has uh, take, taken has followed both of those uh, patterns, but uh, instead of maybe two different stages of columns like Wren might have done, he used single mass uh, col colossal Corinthian columns, which have their own individual entablatures, which Wren usually, rarely did. And this, the entablatures in turn, in turn support this immense plaster barrel vault ceiling with geometric features. At the very end is a Venetian window. Now, our next chapter we might call English Palladians. And you say, well, haven't we been talking a lot about Palladio already? And I would say, yes, we have, but to the fore came a group of mainly noblemen with their design retainers, and they were passionately devoted to the work of Andrea Palladio and to the man they regarded as his chief interpreter in England, Inigo Jones. And they viewed the work of uh, some much of the work of Wren and certainly Hawksmoor as being uh, corruptions of uh, pure Palladianism, and they were determined to restore purity. Uh, one of their leaders was the nobleman, Richard Boyle, Earl of Burlington, we see here. Burlington was quite enamored of Italian art. He collected a lot of the art. He also uh, found a, quite a passion for Italian Renaissance architecture and Palladio's architecture and collected a lot of plates and drawings of it. He even trained himself to become an architect. He, one of his protégés was a painter, William Kent, and under Burlington's patronage, Kent became an architect. Uh, one of the first buildings that Burlington design was a, a villa of sorts for at his estate in Chiswick, uh, built in the 1620s. Now, one of the ironies of this design is despite Burlington's protestation of being devoted to the purity of Palladio's design, this villa is not very pure in terms of Palladio's buildings. It was supposed to be based on the Villa Rotunda by Palladio, 
uh, which had a round dome and, and uh, temple fronts on all four elevations of a square villa. And here instead, Burlington has freely departed from that model and created an eight-sided dome and only one single temple front on the facade and then used these elaborately staged stairways, which had no precedent in Palladio. If we look at the garden front, we see an element that uh, Burlington and Kent invented, which was to use extensively in Palladian architecture, namely a Venetian window recessed inside arch, blind arches. Now, Kent made his way in the world. He became an architect uh, for a, min, a number of great country houses in the Palladian style. There's almost only one major building by Kent left in London, that is the Horse Guards uh, at Whitehall. Uh, and uh, looking at this, we can see one of the major principles of Palladian architecture was a central pavilion uh, to, the, to added to which were wings and additional pavilions absolutely symmetrically disposed. Now, the element that particularly to note here is the Palladian's uh, pr principle was that if the, the, the wings and the additional pavilions were subtracted, the central pavilion would continue to look uh, with all of its integrity intact, its design integrity intact, which we see is the case. If you subtract the wings on your side, this building looks completely uh, complete, uh, complete design. Now, looking at Kent's treatment of this, we can see the influence of Inigo Jones in this uh, uh, rusticated stone blocks, which co cover the facade. Also note the use of this uh, device we noted earlier, Venetian window recessed within uh, uh, blind arches and replicated uh, across the facade. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit, bit and take a look at Georgian terraces. These came to dominate the West End of London during the 18th century for about 100 years in the reigns of the four Georges. One of the, some of the best examples are Bedford Square. Here's one of them. Uh, and if we look at the design of this, we can see the influence of Wren at Chelsea, can't we, with this stone frontispiece composed of colossal ionic columns. At the ground level, we have uh, rusticated stone blocks, also a, a, a staple of Italian Renaissance architecture. And then on either side of this sparkling white frontispiece are expanses of brick wings on either side. This appears to, and certainly was, designed as a single unit. But if we look closer, we see that it is really broken up into individual townhouses and their individual uh, entryways. Another characteristic of the Git Terrace was the use of dark brown or gray brick and very simply detailed windows. Now this was to have a great impact on the West End. As we can see on the side street leading into Bedford Square, with or without frontispieces, these expanses of bricks with these rows of windows. We're going to uh, conclude our discussion with, this, with an examination of two masters of classicism in late, the late 18th century, namely Sir William Chambers versus his great rival, Robert Adams. First Chambers, uh, he was born to a, a wealthy Scout, Scottish family. Uh, he uh, was actually, actually born though in Sweden. Uh, he went to sea and made a voyage to uh, China, to the city of Guangzhou in Southern China and solved Chinese architecture. He came back to England, decided to become an architect, went to Paris and studied French architecture and ultimately ended up in Italy studying Roman and Roman Italian Renaissance architecture, uh, came back. This was the training uh, uh, predictable for a successful architect in uh, uh, England in the late 18th century. He was fortunate to come to the attention of the royal court, particularly the Princess of Wales and her son, the future George III. He even became architectural tutor to George III. The princess and the prince asked him to design a folly for Kew Gardens, where they had a, uh, where they had a major house, and uh, Chambers obliged by designing a Chinese pagoda. And we take a closer look at this. We can see it has some Georgian elements, namely the use of brown brick, this blind arch at center flanked by Georgian windows with, uh, with uh, lunette windows above. In between each story are skirt, skirt roofs, on top of which are these delightfully slithering ceramic dragons, which Chambers designed and which recently have been restored. Now, when George III came to the throne, in due course, Chambers was appointed Surveyor General of the King's Works. This is the position that Jones and uh, Wren, Wren had held before him in charge of all the buildings of the royal government. And one of his principal achievements in architecture in London, the only building, really major building left of his in London, uh, is a Somerset House, a major front of which faces the Thames, behind which are two large courts, additional wings. Uh, let's take a look at one of these. You can see that there's a debt to Wren, going back to Chelsea, in this frontispiece at the center, 
composed in this case with these colossal Corinthian columns. Also note, despite Chambers' devotion to Roman architecture, he is uh, uh, drawn from uh, Inigo Jones, the idea of covering the entire facade with rusticated stone blocks. We have uh, urns as decorative elements above the balustrade. And then atop the frontispiece is this rather diminutive uh, cupola, which I must say doesn't really dominate this wing successfully. His rival then is Robert Adam. Uh, Robert Adam came from another well-to-do Scottish family. His father was an architect. He and his brothers uh, all went into architecture. Uh, Robert Adam in particular went to Italy and had a passion for Roman ruins, making measured drawings of them, also for Italian Renaissance architecture. And he studied with an eminent uh, French architect, Clara So. Now, in terms of his interest in measured drawings, he and a companion crossed the Adriatic Sea and made measured drawings of the Roman Emperor Diocletian's palace that split. We see one of the perspective views created by Adam and his companion of the, the palace. Uh, he then assembled a book of me measured drawings of Roman uh, buildings, including the, the palace that split. And this established his credentials in England as an authority in Roman architecture. Now, when Adam returned, he became what you might call a society architect. Uh, that is, he designed, designed uh, interiors, particularly for great country houses of the nobility and wealthy people. Um, he did design very few country houses in total, uh, but instead designed many interiors. So let's take a look at one of these. An example is Sion, uh, the house of the Dukes of Northumberland near London. We're looking at the facade, which was designed in the early 18th century as sort of a pseudo medieval facade with, this, uh, with these crenellations or battlements. If we go inside and take a look at the plan, and we see the house that uh, Adam found, the black lines denote that original plan, which had a meant large courtyard at center. Adam first designed an immense rotunda based on Roman architecture. The family decided not to build this. Instead, Adam de designed a new interiors for a series of suites that went around three sides of the courtyard. Let's take a look at a couple of these. First, the entry hall is based on a Roman basilica. Uh, with an apse at the end with these eight-sided uh, uh, coffers from Roman imperial architecture. Also from Roman architecture is this entablature composed of triglyphs. Now, again, I like Chambers, desp despite Adam's uh, devotion to Roman architecture, he was free to adopt one of Inigo Jones' motifs, namely these deeply upraised wooden beams encrusted with plaster that form geometric patterns of the ceiling and then are loosely echoed in the, so the floor those black and white marble patterns sort of reflecting the geometric patterns. The family bought Roman scap uh, sculptures uh, from Italy and brought them up uh, to make this interior look more antique. If we look up, we see the essence of what became known as the Adams style. These attenuated, miniaturized, exquisitely uh, proportioned and ex executed versions of Greek and Roman uh, design motifs, such as uh, uh, rosettes and anthemia. Uh, exquisitely ex, uh, executed by plasters under the supervision of Robert Adam. Now, adjoining the entry hall is what is called the ante room. It's really a palatial room. And I think this is one of the supreme accomplishments of Robert Adam and his interior design. If we look at it, the, the, the perimeter of the room is bounded by onic columns uh, uh, with their individual entablatures on top of which stand gilded Roman statues. Uh, the shafts of the columns and the floor with this geometric pattern are made of material, a new material called scaliola, which was made of compressed of uh, marble dust and other materials compressed and highly polished. If we look up at the ceiling, we see it's made up of these ridges, these gilded moldings that uh, form geometric patterns, in, so inside which are swags from Italian Renaissance architecture and finally a medallion of uh, foliated forms. And then also from the Renaissance are these horizontal panels with uh, arabesque. And then finally, these creative three-dimensional sculptures, gilded sculptures, which pop out of the walls. And the ensemble really is a stupendous aesthetic achievement. And then let's look finally at the, the great, the, the long gallery at Sion. Uh, Adam designed every inch of the walls and the ceilings. If we look at the walls, we see they're dominated by these attenuated flat two-dimensional uh, pilasters with uh, arabesque on the shafts. Periodically, then there are plaster panels with arabesque and plat low relief plaster and then marble mantles. And if we look up at the ceiling, we see the essence of the Adams style 
as it was popularly known and, and much imitated, with geometric forms, circles, squares, diamonds, or lozenges, abounded by gilded moldings, inside which are these dainty uh, arabesque, plaster arabesque, uh, that were uh, a characteristic element of uh, Adam's arch. And then the final uh, piece de resistance, I think, is the use of varied types of colors within these panels. Really an aesthetic, another aesthetic uh, coup de force of Robert Adam. Well, I hope this has given you in a very short time an, an overview of some of the major themes of London architecture between 1066 uh, and uh, 1800. And I'd like to close by showing the sources I used and some of the photo credits. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Glass. This was a fascinating look at London's architecture. Uh, uh, the styles uh, have changed so much over the centuries, and, and it's fascinating to, uh, to see those changes. Uh, we do have some time for a few questions. Um, something that uh, I think might be uh, noteworthy um, it should be pointed out that, uh, speaking of Sir Christopher Wren, he he actually died on February the 25th, 1723. So the 300th anniversary of his death will actually be this Saturday. <laughs> um, and because of that, there are lots of tributes to uh, Christopher Wren over all over the world. So um, one of the things, as you pointed out, uh, Christopher Wren was not only an acclaimed architect, but he was also a mathematician, as you said, an astronomer and a scientist. Was he considered a child prodigy? Uh, was he considered the Leonardo da Vinci of his time, would you say? I think that might be an apt characterization. I don't know whether he was a child prodigy, but he certainly, but and by uh, in his adolescence, certainly was considered a genius, uh, and uh, widely acclaimed. He had a reputation as a, as you indicate, uh, Jeff, as a mathematician uh, and astronomer uh, on the continent, even before he was known for his work as in architecture. Um, one question is: uh, we we begin with the Duke of Normandy. Uh, Briefly, where did he get his inspiration? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the Duke or William the Conqueror had any particular architectural training himself, but he had masons that were well imbued with the Romanesque architectural style uh, that was uh, spread across much of France uh, and particularly took root in Normandy. And so uh, his uh, masons that he brought from Normandy were familiar with the Romanesque forms, the round arches, the, the plans of churches, basilican plan, uh, the, the, the early use of uh, masonry vault, uh, vaults, uh, rib vaults uh, came out of the Norman, Norman Romanesque. And uh, these imports uh, uh, really sort of implanted the Norman Romanesque style. All right. Um, was the ceiling of St. John's Chapel ever painted? I don't know the answer to that. That would be an interesting question to inquire further. Okay. I would I would guess that as much emphasis is put in restoration uh, these days and for some time, that they're trying to present an authentic uh, appearance of that chapel uh, to the period perhaps when William and his court were there. So my guess would be that it was not painted, but I don't know if that for sure. All right. Um, one question is... Uh, where were the columns sourced for all of Wren's churches? Well, uh, I think pattern books uh, were a chief source for Wren and his surveyors that worked under him. Um, these were There are a number of these pattern books from the 16th century and even to the 17th century. And so uh, the Masons and other uh, designers would use these as source books and adapt them for uh, use in particular instances. There were a lot of different sources, uh, models, and so they could use different interpretations of the four orders of architecture in different, in different buildings. 
one of the things to note about the city churches is that Wren uh, gave, was the overview that gave overview designs, but there were many other surveyors that worked out the details. So there were many minds choosing columns for these uh, city church interiors. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, um, what size labor force was involved in building a major structure such as St. Paul's? I don't have any figures for you on that, but it was an immense undertaking, as I think everyone would recognize. So there would be a large force um, over 35 to 40 years. The initial force with the design stage, Wren and his surveyors were designing it. Uh, they had on their staff uh, master masons, plasterers, uh, joiners, carpenters, uh, glaziers, uh, and uh, they, these would form bodies of uh, uh, professionals that would uh, execute each aspect of the building. The masons uh, in particular would start in the, the uh, construction of the stone. You have quarry people at the, the stone quarries. I mean, it was a massive undertaking, uh, taking many, many uh, building disciplines in order to achieve. Um, someone mentions that um... The uh, the parish church in the United States that was reconstructed by Wren, um, it is the uh, St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury in Fulton, Missouri, on the campus of Westminster College. Um, that uh, particular church was uh, was destroyed by the Great Fire. Then it was heavily damaged by um, the, the German Blitz in 1940, and eventually it was rebuilt brick by brick here in Fulton, Missouri. So that's uh, quite a, an accomplishment and a tribute to Christopher Wren. I should say so, and thank you, Jeff, for bringing that to my attention. And um, one final question. Um, uh, how did Sir Christopher Wren manage to design so many churches in St. Paul's Cathedral in the city of London simultaneously? <laughs> well, uh, perhaps it's a little bit. Uh, they were being done simultaneously, but they were done in sequence also. I mean, St. Paul's had to be addressed immediately. That was a major symbol of the city and the country. Um, I think it probably took many, many years to address all 51 of those church sites. Um, but uh, they had to be done somewhat sequentially uh, because uh, Wren did not have an endless staff um, to work on them. Uh, yeah, and I think I mentioned earlier about the different types of uh, professions that were encompassed in a, in a, a building, uh, a design build staff, you might call it, uh, for, a, for a church or a building. They had masons, carpenters, joiners, uh, et cetera. Excellent. Well, we again thank you for this uh, presentation and uh, interesting uh, history of the of the London architecture. So now I would like to uh, turn it over to our executive director, Karen Karpowicz. Thank you so much, Dr. Glass. And I want to again thank Jeff Schnabel and the entire Happy Hour Committee for their wonderful curation of these programs, which are so popular with our members. Um, I also want to thank our colleagues in Indianapolis uh, who put this together. It was quite a treat. Um, I think that we all learned a lot about London architecture and the insights behind the scenes when we see those buildings when we're over there. So thank you again. I want to remind everyone that we have another happy hour scheduled for March the 15th, and uh, we have a return speaker, Anna, Anna Marie Anisi, who I know we've done programs with her on Charles Dickens and Shakespeare, is going to be back this time talking about Sherlock Holmes, and I know that there'll be a fun quiz involved. So please join us at four o'clock Eastern Standard Time in uh, New York and um, for Anna, Anna Marie and Sherlock Holmes. Thank you again, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in March. <laughs>